When preparing for the KB Lake launch prior to embargo lift, the i3-7350K had us the most interested for Intel's upcoming platform. The 7350K is the first overclockable i3 that Intel has shipped to the enthusiast market and reminded us in some ways of Intel's G325A Anniversary Edition Pentium that overclocked so well. This time though, it's a dual-core quad-thread CPU that stands to displace some of Intel's own low-end i5 market. We'll be benchmarking and overclocking the 7350K in today's review to find out how well it positions itself. Before getting to that, this coverage is brought to you by our Patreon backers over at patreon.com slash gamersnexus. You can help us out there and it's a direct contribution, so there's no better way to support the channel if you like this type of coverage. The i3-7350K has a few important specifications of note. One of them, of course, it's a two physical core CPU, but has four threads. So it's relying on hyper-threading for the rest. And in terms of clock rate, there's no turbo boost on this one. It's just a hard fixed number, 4.2 gigahertz, which is higher than the base clock of the i5-7600K. Uh, but the boost is, of course, where it's at for that processor because it does actually have boost functionality. Cache is also a bit different and is another major point of differentiation. The i3-7350K has four megabytes of Intel's smart cache, where the i5 KSKU CPU has six megabytes or two extra, and the i7 KSKU has eight megabytes, so it's four, six, eight, pretty easy. All of this also means that until you overclock it, you can expect the 7350K to run at a lower power consumption than its more expensive KSQ brethren. The 60 watt TDP is an indicator that smaller coolers can also be used to keep the 7350K under control, though its $180 price point suggests that you might really be better off overclocking this thing and putting it under a good cooler that's more worthwhile. This isn't positioned like the i7 KSQ CPUs where people buy it and use it just to sort of quote have the best because it's not the best and it's a KSQ and it's $180 and it's an i3. So in order to get any value out of this thing, you really should only be buying it if you're considering overclocking. Don't even bother if you're just gonna throw it in a system in the hopes that maybe one day you might want to. In terms of architecture, the 14 nanometer plus branding for the process, all that stuff, it's all the same. The specs are mostly the same everywhere else except where we've already listed the differences. And architecture hasn't changed from the 7700K review. So if you're interested to learn more about the underlying parts of the CPU, then check out the 7700K review. It's the same thing that doesn't change. Testing methodology, as always, the link in the description below has the full written review and more importantly, an entire page dedicated to testing methods that were used for this processor. If you're confused or curious about what motherboard, memory, drivers, video card, any of that stuff that we used for the testing, check the article. Each platform is defined there. With regards to the CPU present, we're now more or less finishing the Intel i3 to i7 stack for testing. So we'll next be moving to add AMD FX CPUs to the bench. We've already tested the 8370 and we'll be adding a few more after that. So keep an eye out for the imminent Zen review. Each edition of a SKU takes a considerable amount of time, hence why we've been adding them incrementally. For thermals, we're seeing the i3-7350K operate at around 65 Celsius when under the same AVX intensive workload as the 7700K and 7600K shown in the table on the screen now. The 7350K has power draw close to 60 watts when under load, and we're operating at the same 1.275 or thereabouts fixed voltage as in the other tests. It's not necessary to use the Kraken X62 at max RPMs that we're using to cool this CPU. You'd be able to keep the 7350K under control with a wide variety of simpler air coolers, making this chip much easier to work with than its hotter counterparts. And just sort of a side note here, thermals are really important. This is the kind of thing that people skip over a lot, but temperature, especially with KB Lake, is something that you should be paying attention to because it's a little bit higher than Skylake. We've seen on average now there's chip to chip variants always. So not a big enough sample size to make a definitive statement, but on average we're seeing six to seven Celsius hotter than the counterparts from the previous generation. And although that's not murderous, if your motherboard is running a high V-core auto and you're not gonna change it, then that's a problem. Gigabyte just fixed this issue with their gaming seven board they're good now, but previously it was about 1.4 volts, too high, so you're gonna run really hot, and it's not necessarily the chip's fault. It could be the motherboard and auto V core, but the processor itself does matter as well because the TIM used on these new KB Lake CPUs is not impressive. 
Starting off with Blender for the benchmarks and the custom render benchmark that we made in-house where we are rendering various monkey heads with different effects applied. We're seeing the i3-7350K at 4.2 gigahertz stock complete the scene render in about 91 minutes. So that's slower than the overclocked 2500K and faster than the i5-3570K stock. Compared to the previous generation i3, we're seeing an improvement of about 9 minutes, or roughly 9% reduction in total render time required. For comparison, the i5-7600K lands us at around 68 minutes pre-overclock, with a 7700K chart topping at 42 minutes pre-overclock. Overclocking the i3-7350K won't get us to the top of the chart, of course, because this is a thread-limited test, but our 5.0 GHz OC gets us about 78.3 minutes required to render the scene, a reduction of about 16 to 17% in total render time from the stock version of the i3 k SKU. This also lands us ahead of the i5-4690K stock CPU and just under the stock i7-2600K. Once overclocked, this new i3 k SKU is on par with a five generation old i7, which really is not bad considering the workload is thread intensive and frequency only helps us so much. To throw some standardized synthetics in here, Cinebench posts the 7350K just below the i5-3570K stock CPU, scoring 466.5 CB marks, though the i3 has stronger single core performance thanks to the boosted frequency. The i3-6300 last gen CPU that we had on hand is awarded 422 CB marks or 163 for single threaded performance. After overclocking the new i3-7350K KB Lake CPU to 5.0 GHz with a 1.35 V core, we land just below the overclocked 2500K at 4.5 GHz for multi-core performance, though that's well ahead in single core performance and also below the i5-4690K stock CPU. For 3D Mark and Time Spy benchmarks, we've got Firestrike and Time Spy in the article linked in the description below on the website. You can find those charts there if you want more standardized and comparable tests to check maybe how your current system compares to an upgraded one. Uh, but now we're going to roll into Watch Dogs 2 and some other gaming benchmarks. Watch Dogs 2 is one of the most thread intensive modern games we've looked at yet, showing significant performance benefit with the hyper threaded i7 CPUs over even higher clocked i5 CPUs. The i3 then should comparatively struggle with this game, and it sort of does, with the 7350K stock CPU operating around 67 FPS average, comparable to the performance of the Ivy Bridge i5-3570K quad core from a few years ago. Looking elsewhere on the bench, we see the 7350K operates at around 20 FPS slower than the stock i5-7600K, or a percentage reduction of almost 30%, and is nearly two times slower than the i7-7700K. For this particular game, most GTX 1060 and RX 480 GPU purchases and up, so 1070, 1080, would be bottlenecked by an i3-7350K, but again, that is game specific and not a blanket statement that applies to everything. Overclocking the CPU gets us an extra couple FPS, but we're more thread limited, again, in this particular title than clock limited, so there's only so much we can actually do. Still, we're at least seeing a market at 10 FPS improvement over the i3-6300 from Skylake. Battlefield 1 places the 7350K CPU at around 124 FPS average with lows tightly timed in the 70 to 80 FPS range. Even the i3-6300 can keep up pretty well with lows again in the same range. Although both CPUs are technically bottlenecking a GTX 1080, they're not really posting a significant bottleneck threat to more realistic cards paired for the platform, again like a 1060 or 480. The i3-7350K ends up right around where the i5-3570K is, it's kind of annoying mix of numbers, from a few generations ago, and not far below an i5-4690K from the more modern era of Intel CPUs. As a reminder, on Total War Warhammer, this game is a bit more variable in its performance than we're used to with the low frame time metrics, so those numbers aren't our driving factor for performance in these benchmarks, though for CPU testing they normally aren't. Moving to Total War Warhammer then, the i3-7350K stock posts only marginal improvements over the i3-6300 stock, with the former scoring around 122 FPS average and 72 FPS, 64 FPS for the lows, while the latter lands at 114 FPS average and 66 FPS or 59 FPS for the lows. Using the i3-7350K as it should be used, that is overclocking it to 5 GHz, we see a significant performance gain up to 140 FPS average with lows now in the 70 to 80 FPS range. That's a gain of about 15% from an overclock, not bad, and puts us nearly in the performance range of an i5-4690K stock. 
Finally, the ashes of the singularity CPU bound benchmark on high is abusive and is more meant to give us a hierarchy than useful FPS metrics since we're more or less ignoring the existence of a GPU. The i3-7350K stock CPU lands just below the 4.5 GHz overclocked i5-2500K on the chart and just above the 3570K stock CPU. Overclocking the 7350K gets us up to about on par performance with the i7-2600K hyper-threaded CPU and just below the i5-6600K. Again, not bad hierarchical placement for an i3 CPU, especially considering the power of the previous gens we're comparing to. We were only able to stabilize an overclock of around 5.0 GHz, and that's with a 1.35 V-Core setting manually, and couldn't really push higher without doing something more extreme and more tuning intensive. Still, 5 GHz for an i3 isn't anything to laugh at, and the performance scaling overall isn't bad post-overclock, just a few games where it's less exciting than others, like Watch Dogs, because we're so thread-limited in that particular title. Still, uh, this CPU has a lot more ifs and requirements attached to it than the previous KB Lake CPUs that we've looked at for this generation. Primarily, the i3-7350K, again, is a CPU that you should absolutely not purchase unless you're planning to overclock it basically on day one. If this is one of those, I might overclock it one day and would like that functionality, don't buy it because chances are you won't and the performance for the price is not that great. If you overclock it, the argument gets a lot better, but still, at $180, it's a huge amount to ask for for an i3, even an overclocking one. At $180, you're approaching non-K SKU i5 territory like the i5-7500 non-K, which is about $204, and other i3 CPUs are significantly less, $150 to $165. The i3-7350K feels like it should be priced at around the $165 mark, that's what the 1K unit pricing is, and that's probably what the consumer pricing should be because that's just where the value is better. So this isn't as exciting as, say, a $60 Pentium G3258. That was a fun chip to buy for 60 bucks and push it with overclocking and see what kind of performance you could get because you really couldn't be mad at that point. For $60, it's like, who cares? You get a year or two out of it and you move on, and that's really not a bad chip if you're trying to tie yourself over. This one is out of that, well out of that range. Three times more than that was. Of course, more powerful. It's got more cores. It's got better staying power in the future with the thread difference that it has. But that doesn't make it a good purchase at 180. So kind of overall, the opinions here would be if you are planning to overclock and you cannot afford, for some reason, the 7600K, then it's maybe worth buying to play around with. But there are Pentiums out there, too, that we'll be looking at soon, hopefully. And uh, this just kind of lands in a very weird price point between a pretty good CPU that'll handle just about any game and true budget CPUs that have more price-friendly uh, markups and positioning in the market. So that's all for this one. Hopefully the numbers help you figure out if it's worth it for you. Definitely overclock if you buy it. We've got Ryzen coming up eventually, soon, TM. Uh, so maybe wait around for that. I, I haven't tested it. It's not being coy. We just we haven't tested it. So uh, give it a wait if you can. Subscribe for more information at Patreon in the post roll video or patreon.com slash gamersnexus. Links in the description below for the full article. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.